All right. Well, welcome everyone to our Skill Up today with Dr. Matthew Vartstra. My name is Jenna Johnson and I'm a graduate learning specialist. I'm just gonna cover a few housekeeping items before I hand the session over to our presenter. Um, a few things to note, we're recording the session today and that video will be posted to our center in the Skill Up page within 24 hours. And if you have questions throughout the session, you could go ahead and type them into the Q&A form located at the bottom of the Zoom window. The chat feature is also open um, and I will be monitoring the chat. So feel free to put your questions in there. And then scrolling subtitles are enabled. You can turn them on if you hover over the bottom of the Zoom window to see those controls. You can click the CC option and choose show subtitles and you can turn those off at any time as well. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Vartstra. Thank you, Jenna, and welcome everybody. I'm happy to be chatting with you today. Um, I am going to go ahead and share my screen and bring up some slides so that we have some things to talk about. If I could find my slides. There they are. And boom. All right. Um, welcome in. Uh, my name is uh, Matt Vardstra. I'm a career advisor here at National University. Um, I have a couple of my colleagues also that I happen to know are here as well. So if you are um, kind of chatting or asking questions, um, I'll encourage Jane um, and others who might be here, um, feel free to answer questions as they come up in the chat too. Um, and I want to give a little bit of credit where credit is due. Um, my entire team really contributed to, to portions of this. Um, so uh, specifically our resume writer, Denise, um, whose PowerPoint um, this is based off of, and then kind of tailored towards graduate students um, with kind of a lean towards um, graduate student resumes um, and then and focusing on kind of the tailored process for resumes. Um, so I've been working in career services here at National for uh, almost a year and a half now, spent a decade at the University of Idaho prior to that, um, working in career services, both on the employer side of things, as well as with students. Um, so excited to talk to you more today about um, how do we tailor a resume so that we get the interview? And that really is the goal of the resume, right? The goal of the resume is how do we get our foot in the door so we can have a conversation with an employer to be able to have that ability to share um, at a greater level with them. Um, so let's talk, uh, by, we'll open by talking a little bit about that. Um, what is the purpose of the resume? Because I think that as we're creating documents, especially when we're talking about job search related things, we want to make sure that we have a goal in mind for what we're writing and so that it's very direct and it's very specific. And, and the goal of the resume, the purpose of the resume is to provide a basically a pretty quick summary when you think about everything you've done over the course of your professional career, over the course of your academic career, we're gonna put all of that onto a one to two page document. And so it's a pretty quick summary of your education, your experience, your skills, the knowledge, abilities, and achievements that you bring to the table for an employer that's going to be reading it for the purposes of giving you a job, giving you an internship, um, whatever it might be that you're utilizing your resume for. Now, we will talk about a little bit, just briefly, the differences between a resume and a CV as well. And so there's a slide on that. Um, and so if you're asked for a CV, I will cover kind of what you might be looking towards. The other thing to keep in mind throughout this entire thing is um, at in the Career Services Office, um, as an NU student or alumni, um, you have full access to our suite of services. I'll go over how to access those at the very end. But if you need to have your resume reviewed, if you need to have a one-on-one -on -one appointment to chat about anything that is career related, all the way from resumes to interview prep, to job searching tips and strategies, to salary negotiation, any of those types of things. Um, that's what we're here for. Um, and we have advisors um, that are assigned to work with you. Um, and so take advantage of our services. Um, so any of this stuff as we're talking, you're like, oh man, I would love to chat more about that. Great. Um, that is what we're here for. So please, please, please feel free to take advantage of a one-on-one -on -one appointment or other workshops that we offer as well. Um, but excited to be talking with you today as part of the Skill Up series. So we want a professional summary, a well-organized and well-written summary as part of the resume. Remember that the resume is often the first impression of you when you're applying to a job. Yes, there's a cover letter, 
generally speaking, most people now agree that the cover letter is read last, basically. Um, the resume is going to be that first impression of you. And so if you don't pass kind of that first impression test with the resume, it's unlikely that the cover letter will also get read. Every business's practices are different behind that. And even recruiters may differ from one another, but it's important to keep that in mind as well. You want to convince the employer that you'll be successful in the position and that you meet the qualifications. And I want to draw specific attention to the meet the qualifications portion of that particular statement. Each resume that you write should be tailored to the job description that you're applying for. And that doesn't mean you need to start from scratch with every resume that you write. Um, you'll have kind of your baseline resume, and then you'll want to be reading a job description and really pulling the details from that job description and blending that into your resume. My best example of this is with the action verb statements, which, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. When you have an action verb statement in a resume, you might say something like created such and such a thing, right? And, and you have an action verb statement tied to the word created as your skill word. In one job description, you might they might say, we're looking for someone who can create such and such things. Great. Then you've got the word created on your resume already. On the next job description you apply to, it might say something like, we're looking for someone to design such and such a thing. Well, now on the resume for that particular job description, we're saying we can design rather than create such and such a thing. Those words mean the same things, but we're tailoring it to the job description very specifically to make sure that we're meeting those qualifications. Additionally, every job description will typically have a list of minimum qualifications and a list of preferred qualifications specifically the minimums, but the preferreds as well, we want to make sure that the resume is structured, formatted, and designed in a way that checkboxes those minimum quals as quickly and efficiently as possible. So if there is a minimum qual listed in that job description, you really want to make sure that the person reading your resume can find that qualification in your resume as quickly as possible. Um, so it becomes kind of a checkbox document where you look at a job description and you look at your resume, am I meeting all of those checkboxes? And how easily is it to find that information? Sometimes that information ends up buried in the resume somewhere. We want to make sure that we're bringing it out, whether through formatting or the order in which we present information to enhance and build upon those things. The resume is also pretty helpful to feed your online presence. Um, so if you have a LinkedIn account, if you have a Handshake account, um, we'll talk about Handshake at the very end. Um, those things can be fed by your resume. Right. So you have a nicely built resume that will populate out to your LinkedIn profile very nicely. There's more to the LinkedIn profile than just that um, and more to LinkedIn than just that. But that's a whole nother conversation. Uh, but if you have a good resume, you can translate that out to your online presences and then also have kind of an online resume where you're searchable, you're findable um, and people can utilize. You can utilize that as part of your job search as well. Bottom line. The resume is a marketing tool where you want to market yourself with the end goal of getting an interview, right? We want to get the foot in the door to get the interview. In order to do that, we want to make sure we meet all those qualifications and give the impression that we would be really good at the job um, so that they want to, to kind of have a conversation with us so that we can talk about our past skills and experiences and stories to be able to have those conversations in an interview. Let's talk about some content and formatting tips. And what we're going to eventually work towards here is actually looking at each section of a resume and actually breaking it down and talking about where can we tailor things there? How do we optimize and maximize that so that we have our the best opportunity possible of getting, getting our foot in the door and getting that interview? Here's a few things that you will want to do as far as your resume is concerned. Um, if you're writing a resume for the very first time, or you're maybe like, you know what, I'm just, I want to revamp my formatting. Start with a blank Word document. Um, if you use a template of any shape or form, almost assuredly, it will not let you do exactly what you want to do. And so that becomes problematic because you might look at some of the suggestions that I make later on in this presentation and be like, oh, I tried to do that. The template wouldn't let me. That's very common. The other problem that, that I personally have with templates and a lot of advisors and recruiters will tell you the same thing is, they end up looking the same. And I don't want your resume to look like everybody else's resume. 
I want your resume to be your own. I'm going to give you formatting tips uh, and, and things that I maybe have personal preference for in a resume. But the way that you create your resume, the way that you decide to put your resume on paper, so long as it follows some best practice guidelines, really should be unique. I don't need it to look like everybody else's. And if you use a template, it most assuredly will. Um, after over a decade of doing this, most advisors and recruiters who have been doing this even for two or three years will be able to recognize templates pretty quickly. And you don't really want that because it doesn't give that impression of like, oh, I spent time making this just for you as the employer who's reading it. It gives the impression that I threw this together using a template and it's not personalized or customized at all. And we want that kind of personalized and customized feel. We're going to use reverse chronological order almost all of the time in a resume. So start with your most recent experience in each section and work your way backwards. We're definitely, as we just talked about, going to target qualifications to the job. So when I say this, and, and I'll, I'll repeat this throughout, because I think that if there's one thing you take away from this entire presentation, if you take away the idea that you need to target or tailor your resume to each job you apply to, that is one of the most important things that I think that I could get across to everybody today. And that is do that targeting, do that tailoring. It's not that your resume needs to change drastically for each different job you apply to, but little shifts and little changes in your resume to match job descriptions make a really big difference to the reader of that resume. Um, so make sure that you're making those little shifts and adjustments in order, uh, in words, maybe even that match those job descriptions. You're going to list your relevant work history, and the keyword here is being relevant. Um, we want to keep everything relevant, and even if the job title wasn't relevant, the skills that you gained from that experience should be relevant, okay? Uh, my example of this is, let's say you've worked in fast food or maybe you are working in fast food because that's what you're doing as you're going to school. This is very common. Um, anything that's kind of disjointed from what you're doing, let's say you're working in fast food, but you're gonna go end up being an accountant. If you're applying to an accounting job and you're talking about your fast food role, um, don't tell me that you flipped hamburgers or cleaned tables. I don't need to know those things. Those things are not important to me. That may be what you did. Instead, tell me something like communicated daily with team members to ensure timely food delivery. Because now you've made a an experience that if I read the title and the place, I wouldn't necessarily as an accounting firm be like, oh yeah, we need someone with that. I, I don't actually. But you can convince me that the skills you gained there are transferable and are very valuable to me based on which skills you choose to talk about. Communication skills, teamwork skills, time management skills, those are all skills that are transferable from just about any experience over into something new that you're going to be doing uh, with a future employer, right? So focus on those key skill and ability statements that are transferable. Um, and hence, uh, use action verb statements. And we'll get into that a little bit more specifically when we jump into the experience section. So you can actually see what I'm talking about. But we want the resume to be quick hitting. And so we start with an action verb. So you'll, you'll see a bullet and then an action verb. And then I'll talk to you about how maybe to write those um, as we get into that section. Past and present tense only. Here's my trick. I just past tense everything in a resume. And my logic for that, and this is where some personal preference comes into play, my logic for that is the reader of your resume is going to be reading it about a job you're going to be having in the future. And everything you have done on your resume to them is in the past. It's all previous experience that you have. So if you want to keep the resume simple and not have to change your verb tense on these action verb statements all the time, even if this, even if it's a present experience that you're doing, just write it in past tense. Um, that way, when you update your resume with new dates and things, you don't actually have to change the verb tense on your on your resume either. Um, I personally like that. I just do past tense on everything for the resume. We want to make sure we use key skill words from your industry to describe your skills, abilities, and accomplishments. And you'll hear those three words from me quite a few times. Skills, abilities, and accomplishments. Those things are what kind of make up good action verb statements. We want to convince the reader of our resume that we have the skills, the abilities, and the accomplishments from our past experiences to be successful in the job that we're applying to or the internship that we're applying to. All right. Here's some things not to do. Uh, already mentioned, don't use templates. Not gonna go over well for you most of the time. Um, additionally, 
um, don't uh, use abbreviations at least as much as possible. Um, for the first time that you say something, feel free for abbreviations and acronyms, write it out, use the parentheses, right? Parentheses afterwards, what you're going to refer to that in the rest of the time. That can be a really nice space saver, okay? So if you have some long acronyms, uh, stuff that shows up multiple times on your resume, write it out the first time, use the parentheses um, tool to then say, for the rest of the time, I'm going to be referring to it as this, and then you can use the acronym or abbreviation after that. We typically won't use pronouns on resumes. Um, again, we're looking for statements rather than sentences. And as soon as you start to include pronouns, you get your full, you're, you're, then, you're, then it's an I statement rather than an action verb statement. So we're gonna avoid those. We're not gonna list references or hobbies. Um, hobbies used to be a thing that got included. References were definitely included for a very long time at the end of resumes. Essentially, what's assumed now is that if they want references, then you will provide them. Um, or in the online portal that you're applying, you'll already be putting in references. So we don't need to waste that valuable real estate, that valuable space on the resume uh, with a references section, essentially. So take your references, put them at the top of a separate document, have the same header from your resume at the top of that one. I also would encourage if you're writing a cover letter, take the header from your resume, put it at the top of that document as well. Makes it look like a nice package deal um, and have your references separate from your resume. We don't include photos, any personal information, health information, um, political, religious affiliations. We're gonna avoid those things. Um, anything that can, can cause unneeded bias or information that the employer really isn't allowed to have um, as part of the hiring process. So we'll remove some of those things. Uh, finally, don't exaggerate or falsify information. It's really important um, that that everything on your resume, that, that they're the skills, abilities, and accomplishments that you actually have. Um, you'll be asked to use those skills, abilities, and accomplishments in your new job. And if you can't do those things because you were exaggerating or falsifying things on your resume, um, that is not going to go over well for you. Um, so don't exaggerate or falsify uh, things on the resume. Okay, a few more do's and don'ts from a content and formatting perspective. Some things to do. We wanna utilize white space effectively. White space on the resume is a careful balance. Um, and you'll see in the example that we go into here in kind of the second half of the presentation that we utilize white space to create readability and make sure that the, the reader knows where to look and how to get to a particular section. Um, so we don't want to eliminate white space. We want to utilize it to show the reader where to go. And we also want to make sure that there's not too much of it in any one section of the page, um, which typically tends to congregate um, over on the right side of the page, right? We read top to bottom, left to right. And so that left side of the page, or sorry, the right side of the page tends to end up uh, being a little bit blank. So I'll talk about some tips and tricks for managing that as we get into the same. We want to use an easy to read, consistent format. This is where you get to customize your resume a little bit. How do you decide to use the bolds? How you decide to use italics and underlines and lines and other things on the resume is really up to you. There are some best practices that I'll go over, but what you choose to do with it, when are, are you going to use a tabbed format where you're kind of moving in and tabbing a little bit more? Are you going to use an underline? Are you all capping your headings? You don't have to. Those are options that you can do. So you want to create a format that is consistent, that's easily readable, and that shows your reader what you want them to read next. Making sure this is consistent becomes kind of the key focus here because we want in each section the reader to be able to find the information that they want to find that they're looking for consistently and quickly across each of the different sections of your resume. So if you put dates in one section in your education section, the dates in your experience section probably need to go in the same place so that if I'm looking for dates, I can just find them wherever they are located in each section, right? So consistency is key. Couple of details. Margins can be anywhere from 0.5 to one inch. My personal preference is closer to 0.5 than one. Um, my reason for that is it looks different. I like it. Number one, gives you more space. Number two, most documents are formatted at one inch to 1.25, something like that inch margin. So when you go to something like a 0.5 or a 0.75 even, it gives the document kind of a different look and feel. I feel like that's a, that's a positive pause for me. Uh, if I can pause on your resume in a good way, that's good. I want that extra time. I want extra time spent on my resume. Um, so I, I like to go with the 0.5. Gives you more room to work with as well. Don't go below 0.5. Then it just looks like you're trying way too hard to squeeze stuff onto the page. 
There's a couple different font options that you have. Um, so most of the time we're going to use those straight line fonts, those sans serif fonts, uh, examples, Calibri, Veranda, Helvetica. Those are gonna be your, <clears throat> your body, your main text. <clears throat> I'm willing to make some exceptions on this. Um, I, I've used Garibond across the entirety of, of a resume before. I think that it looks okay. We want it to be very readable. The the a little bit more of the the fonts that have a little bit more of the the curl or swerve to them can get a little bit tricky to read. Um, so, but often those become popular to use as headings. The serif fonts like Garibond, uh, Cambria, those ones become maybe popular to use in headings. That's the only reason why you should change font types in a resume though, okay? One section to another, we're not changing font types. If all your headers are in a serif font, if all your headers are Garamond, then all your headers should be Garamond, but then nothing else should change. Maybe everything else is in Calibri, right? Um, so don't mess around too much with fonts except for headers and then everything else, okay? Font size can be between 10 and 12. Careful here because depending on the font that you choose, 10 can be very, very small and 12 can be very, very big. Uh, for example, Times New Roman is a very, very big font. 12 point Times New Roman looks gargantuan on paper and takes up way more space than you probably want it to. So a 10 point Times New Roman is probably good. Garamond, on the other hand, is a very small font. And so if you go 10 point Garamond, it will be very small and probably too small to use. Um, so be aware of the font type that you choose because that will kind of pair with the font size. Font size is something to play with a little bit if you're struggling to get everything onto one or two pages. If you're like, oh, I can't quite get it onto the second page, eh, maybe I'm going to go from an, a 12 to an 11. And that gives me a little more space to play with, right? So you can use it to kind of get space back on the page if you need it, if you're not going too small on the font, right? We want it to be readable. We don't want them to have to zoom it in all the way on their screen. Or if they're printing it, um, squint at it, right? So make sure you get a good font size. Make sure you get some uh, proofreading and feedback, and that's literally what we're here for in Career Services. Um, have friends, colleagues, faculty, classmates also can do this, uh, but this is what we do. Um, we look at resumes and help people with career stuff on a day-to-day -day basis, and so we are happy to, to do that, to look through it. You can schedule appointments with us. Um, you can also use our resume Dropbox. So we have a specific resume Dropbox where you can actually send in uh, a solid draft version of your resume and get feedback from our resume writer. Um, all of those things are options for you within uh, Career Services. Uh, show the reader what you want them to see. Um, so this is something that we say a lot, um, both in, in resumes, but also in interviews. Um, these are show, don't tell documents. If you just tell me something, I'm still questioning whether you actually have it or not. If you show me through examples and through context, that's much more powerful than it might otherwise be, right? Um, so just you know, think, think of it that way as you're going through. It's a show, not a tell document. Uh, you know, show and tell, the show was always more interesting than the tell, right? Hey, if you went to show and tell at elementary school and you were just doing the tell part, that'd be kind of boring. So we want the show part because that's the part that, that people are excited about, right? Don't use fancy fonts, borders, and layouts. Um, this is this is something where there are some exceptions. In if you're in a more design oriented or a more creative oriented field, you have some leeway on your resume to do some design oriented things to it that you might not otherwise be doing. If you're in, for example, a more business oriented or an accounting, for example, it's going to be pretty straightforward. Probably not going to use a ton of color, um, but uh, color is acceptable on most resumes nowadays. We want to use kind of not a lot of it, maybe just headers or a line here or there. And we want it to be kind of earthy, nothing bright or vibrant, kind of earthy toned down colors. Um, and that might be, uh, for example, your name might be a different color. Maybe a line that's underneath each of your sections is a different color. So a, a little bit of color um, has been introduced now. Again, some fields are more formal than others and, and will frown upon color a little bit more than others might, um, but a splash of color is not uncommon nowadays. <clears throat> uh, don't try to crowd everything onto one page. And this is specifically um, for a lot of you who are working on master's degrees <clears throat> or advanced degrees, PhDs, anything beyond that. Don't try to cram everything on one page. You have multiple degrees to talk about. You have a lot of experiences, potentially internships, other past experiences to talk about. Don't limit yourself to that one page. However, as it says on the bottom, uh, also don't go past that two page mark. If you're asked for a resume, a resume is a one to two page document. 
Now we'll talk here in just a second about CVs where we have a little bit more leeway, but if you're asked for a resume, stick within that two pages. But again, don't feel the need to cram everything on one page. Two page resumes are considered perfectly acceptable um, nowadays. Um, so don't be afraid to use those two pages. The key there is make sure that everything you're telling them is highly relevant information, specific to that job description, specific to that industry and company, and then you're gonna be perfectly fine going on the two pages with your resume. We already talked about not using tiny fonts. We actually suggest not using headers and footers. So the tendency is we call the first part of a resume a heading um, or even a header, but we're not going to use the actual header function in Word. Um, the headers just act a little different and give a little extra weird spacing in things. So I like to have full control over the document. So the header that we put into the resume, just don't use the header function in Word to put it in. That was incredibly confusing, but hopefully it made sense. And we'll talk about that um, and, and show you that section here in just a second. Okay, let's talk uh, key components. And what we're gonna do um, after this, we'll talk CVs, and then we'll actually break down a resume kind of specifically by some of these sections to take a look at what kind of best practice or optimal kind of looks are for these different sections. Your standard headings are over there. Um, typically, we're going to start with a summary. This is very popular now, a skills section, and we'll talk about each of these. Uh, we're going to go to education. We're going to have an experience section. Uh, technology and computer skills is very common to have. Throw languages in there if you speak other languages. Um, languages, another very, very common uh, skill that we want to add in and something that sets you apart from other candidates. So we want that if you have it. And then usually uh, some sort of community service or volunteerism section, if you have kind of active ongoing volunteerism and community service. Uh, we'll talk about each of those as we go. These don't always have to have the same names necessarily. So you could change the summary to summary of qualifications. Sometimes I'll see it listed as profile. Um, your skills sections could be an areas of expertise or a competency section. So there's different words you can use. Sometimes being more simplistic in your headings can be nice. If you're going into an applicant tracking system and there's some scanning going on and it's easier to read and be des uh, like taken out of your, your resume format and put into whatever structure they want on their back end through their applicant tracking system. Um, so it can be helpful to use kind of more standard headings, uh, but there are other options you can use as well. Sometimes it's nice to separate out your experience sections. If you've got kind of like a, a very specific, like if you're if you're in teaching, a teaching experience section is very common. So you can be kind of industry specific in how you describe your experiences sections, and that's totally fine as well. Sometimes I'll see a professional experience or a related experience section, and then like an additional experience or an additional relevant experience section. So you can separate things out a little bit. That can help, especially if you end up needing or wanting to have um, anything particular from uh, maybe an older experience that's more relevant than a newer one, then you can call a section relevant experience, bring that section up, even though it's not anymore in reverse chronological order, it still will be in reverse chronological, chronological order within section. And so you can you can pull stuff like that off if you're if you're having kind of two separate experience sections. Hopefully that makes some sense. Um, additionally, um, certifications, if you have any of those um, languages, as I mentioned, are other potential headings that you can include within the resume. Again, you don't have, to have all of these. You want to have uh, the ones that make the most sense for you. The standard ones being kind of, again, your, your baseline typically uh, for a resume. All right. One, one more slide here, and then we'll kind of stop for uh, a couple of questions if there are any before we move on. What if you're asked for a CV? Now, this could be very common for some of you, especially depending on where you're headed with your master's degree or with a PhD or advanced degree that you're working towards. If you're headed in the academics, a CV is going to get asked for a lot more than otherwise. If you're headed somewhere that's maybe more research focused or research oriented, that's another place where we'll see CVs uh, asked for a lot. So pay attention to what you're being asked for. Most of the time it is going to be a resume, but if you're asked for a CV, don't worry, it's not that different than a resume. We're just gonna expand a little bit more and now we've kind of ditched the page length requirement. Um, so let's talk about the difference. The resume is a concise look at your most relevant experiences tailored for a specific position. 
And it's not that we don't tailor a CV, we probably would a little bit, but the CV is a much longer document. It's going to go through just about everything. We're not going to kind of hold back on and just make it um, these specific things. Um, it details your academic and professional experiences across your career. Typically, you're looking at anywhere from three to five pages for a CV. I've seen longer CVs for people who have been in the field professionally for a very long time. Once you start to push that five page mark with a CV, we start to think about, well, what are they going to read? And when they get when you get asked for a CV, the tendency is they do want to read everything like they want to read it. They're academics typically. And so that's what that's part of their DNA. Um, so they want to read something long. If we're pushing five pages, we want to make sure everything is relevant. And if it gets if it gets too old, maybe then we might think about, well, do we cut that or do we say, you know, maybe shrink something down in order to get that a little bit shorter. But again, I think over five pages is fine, depending on the length of your career and kind of the stuff that you've been doing. But the structure and format is basically the same CV to resume. Um, I don't really have anything where I'd be like, oh, like do this differently in a CV from a formatting standpoint. We still want it to be readable. We still want it to be quick hitting. We still want it to have those key skill and ability statements in it um, from a CV standpoint as well. What you'll most often see that's different in a CV besides length is added headers. There's a lot of different headings that you might put in that will enhance uh, a CV. Typically, there's going to be a research experience section. A lot of the times you'll see publications and presentations. You're going to want to format those in the style of whatever field you're in. So for a lot of you, it would be APA formatting, right? You'd want your publications formatted in APA. Presentations would be the same thing, right? associations and professional memberships, any grants that you've been a part of or worked on, honors and awards are a little bit more common um, in a CV as well. Not that any of those things could not be on a resume. They could be if those things are important. In fact, associations and professional memberships, we will oftentimes see on a resume potentially. Um, so just things to think about as far as when you're writing a CV as opposed to a resume, because you have more pages to work with, you can talk about more things. You may not be able to fit all of these things into a resume. In fact, there's no way you'd be able to, in two pages, talk about your education, your experiences, your summary, your skills, your technology skills, your, your uh, community service, and then throw in your presentations, your publications, your grants. Like you're going to go over two pages. And so then you've created more of a CV. So you have difficult decisions to make if you're asked for a resume and you're used to making a CV. Cutting that down to the two pages is important. And so we want to do that. Um, on the resume if that's kind of the direction that you're being asked for. But CVs are asked for as well. Um, and so those are kind of the differences that you might see between those two things. Before we jump into the breakdown um, of each of those sections on the resume and talk through each of them briefly to kind of give you an idea of what the resume might actually look like, um, are there any questions or comments or ponderings thus far? There definitely are. So we have some questions in the Q&A. Perfect. Um, the first one is regarding font sizes. So should the font size differ between a heading and the body? Great question. It can. Um, it doesn't always. That's, again, kind of a personal preference choice as far as formatting is concerned. Oftentimes you might see it a little bit bigger. But if you've already done something like all caps it, if you've all caps a heading, and then, and then you're you don't really need to make it any bigger. Then you don't need to. But uh, there is definitely the option to do that, right? As long as the body is all the same and each of your headings is all the same, then you're good to go. Perfect. And we also have a question related to uh, if you do have a second page for your resume, do you need to have a matching heading? Yes and no. It doesn't have to have all of the information in it, um, but your name uh, would be good to have at the top. Um, and then oftentimes you'll see like some people will put like a two or, or a second page or something like that off to the side. That's not necessary necessarily, um, but I like to see at least the name. Uh, it doesn't have to have the whole uh, header information necessarily as part of it, but you do want to kind of tie the two together in some way, shape or form. We do have one more question. Okay. Um, should you say that you are a student on the resume? 
A another good question. Um, we'll talk about that in just a moment when we talk about the education section. And there are a couple of different spaces where um, it will either become apparent that you are a student or you could list that potentially. And it really depends. I, I like this question because it depends on the purpose of your resume. Um, if you're applying to a practicum or an internship where it's where you need to be a student most of the time in order to do one of those things, it can become more important to identify a certain way. Um, if you're approaching graduation and you maybe are still a student, but you're about to get your degree, much less important to indicate that you're still a student because you're looking for a job for when you graduate, right? Yeah, but we'll, we'll through dates, we'll be able to, to demonstrate that as well in the education section. So we will talk about that. Gotcha. And then there, there is one more question, but I'm thinking we're probably going to be covering it in the next few slides. Okay. It's about incorporating soft skills. Yes, we will be talking about that momentarily. Uh, but right. I love that it is a question already because that is uh, definitely important um, on the resume for sure. Awesome. All right, perfect. Cool. Thank you all for the questions. Uh, please feel free, continue to, to ask. Um, and again, uh, I, I see Jane, so I know Jane's here. So I know we have other career advisors um, in the in the audience as well. So if you're if you're chatting um, and you want, uh, you know, Jane can also pop quick answers to things in the chat as well. And then yes, more questions. I'll save, well, if I go fast, I'll save time for questions at the end. Okay, let's break down the resume. Um, and this is where um, I'll probably go relatively quickly through each of these just because I want to show them to you and I want to make sure I get you all the content. Um, but I can also share these slides and we can share resume samples and other things with you. Um, if you reach out to us, we're again, happy to kind of talk in more detail through this, even on your specific resume. Um, that's really, again, what we, that's what we do. And so we're happy to like, schedule an appointment, send us your resume in advance. We'll open it up and work on it together, looking at your resume um, and make kind of tailored suggestions to you. Um, so, but I want to cover everything and make sure that you have an idea of what you're working with as you're getting started on a resume or editing your existing kind of resume draft. The heading, this is the starting point of the resume. And it, it actually is very important. Um, I want your name to be the biggest and boldest thing on the page. So when we we're just talking about font size, here's where, yes, increase the font size on your name. If you don't, I'll do it for you um, when you review your resume with me, uh, because I want your name to stick in their head. If anything else, I want my name to be in their head, hopefully with a positive association because our resume looks really clean and we have the right skills and abilities and we've tailored the resume to their position. But... Uh, moreover, I just want your name to be in their head. So your name, biggest and boldest thing on the page. And don't go too crazy. Like we want it to be like not, not exploding off the page. We just want it to be the biggest and boldest thing on the page. Standard information for the heading, phone, email, city, state. And if you have it and you've worked on your LinkedIn profile and you're, you're at least okay with, uh, with the way it looks and it reflects your resume appropriately, your LinkedIn profile. Okay. Your LinkedIn URL. You can also customize those. Again, I don't want to get too far onto the LinkedIn side of things, but you can customize your LinkedIn URL. So it's not when you start, when you first get it, it's like linkedin.com slash number, 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 your name, a couple more numbers and some dots and slashes. Um, you can customize that URL. Um, so if you want to, you can just Google search that. Um, so you can customize that down to something more readable. It looks a lot better on a resume that way as well. We used to put full address in these. Uh, we don't really do that anymore. Um, it's just superfluous information. We don't really need it anymore. Um, city state is common. I'll even leave out city state sometimes if you're applying somewhere where you do not currently reside um, and that may bias them against you. Like, oh, it's not a local. They might have to move. Uh, that might be complicated. Um, I'll leave city state out even sometimes um, just because I just don't think it's important information for them to make hiring decisions based off of. Um, so, however, if you are applying to somewhere where you are local, then I will put it on there because I want the opposite effect, right? Like, oh, yes, a local person, like they're already here. They know the area, whatever, right? Um, so do put city state if you're applying locally. You could potentially take it off um, if, you're, if you're not local. Little note, make sure your email and your voicemail are professional for the email and voicemail that you're putting on your resume. Um, you want that uh, the voicemail is one that I think people oftentimes forget about. Um, what is what is your current voicemail? Do you know? Um, because I don't think I've updated mine in decades, probably. Um, and so make sure that, that voicemail is still professional sounding and your email address has also got that uh, professional uh, feel to it. 
Sometimes something new that we're starting to see on resumes is uh, that last word where it says on this on this example where it says uh, communications. Um, sometimes we'll put the role or kind of a position that you're going towards as kind of a descriptor for yourself or for who you are planning to be professionally. This is an optional thing. Uh, I've seen it work really well for some people when they have kind of a particular thing in mind, particularly if you already have some experience and a background in that thing, you can kind of state like, this is what I do. This is who I am um, in a quick kind of title, um, data analyst, right? Like if you've done those things, uh, great. Um, then you kind of put that up at the top. Um, oftentimes you want that to reflect obviously the job you're applying to, but you don't want to have to tweak it so much that it just like states the job title that you have, unless it's directly what you have done and what you are in the past, right? Uh, but this is an option for you um, kind of at the top there within the header information. The next section is the summary section. And honestly, I think this is probably the most complicated section on a resume. Um, this is where you get to write a little highlight of yourself, a little descriptor of you that kind of entices the reader into wanting to read the rest of your resume. I don't like it to take up more than about three lines, maybe four if you have kind of an extensive work history um, or a lot of experience in the field. If you take up much more than that, then it just becomes a big block of text at the top of the resume. And guess what happens to big blocks of text on resumes? Uh, they get skipped. Uh, you read the first like two or three words and then you're like, okay, I'm moving on to the next thing. Uh, statistics tell us that you actually have less than six seconds to make an initial impression with your resume. So we want to avoid blocks of text if at all possible, because anything important in there is not going to be read, especially upon the initial review um, of that. So that first, the first line is usually pretty key. And what I like to do actually is use it as a checkbox moment, right? So one of the minimum qualifications on a lot of job descriptions is looking for someone with this many years of experience. If you're applying to jobs where years of experience is a component of the, the qualifications, the very first line here is a really great space to check that box off of their qualifications list. Uh, let's accounting professional with X number of years experience, right? That's your opening line for your summary. And now, yes, I can go down and do the math and the experience section to figure it out. But I'm, I'm actually, as the, as the writer, I've actually done that for you. Here's my years of experience. I meet your requirement. There's your checkbox for your initial review, right? Um, so utilize this summary section to be pretty specific about what check boxes might I want to tick right off the bat with this particular company? And how do I tailor this particular section to the job description that I'm looking at? Because this is your first opportunity to do some pretty heavy targeting towards how do I write my summary so that it really reflects what they're looking for in this particular job description at this particular company, right? Um, so be specific and be detailed with this because it, the the your opportunity to tailor this is definitely there. Uh, it's still going to be written in statements. I don't, we don't want to see full sentences here or anything. We'll save that for the cover letter. Um, so again, this one is a little bit, it, there's kind of a very much like a cover letter. There's like an art and a science to this. Like, here's what I want to do, but I also want to do it in a way that is my own. Um, and that's very descriptive to you. Um, so it's difficult to say, like, write it exactly this way, because it depends on who you are and what job you're going for. Um, so hopefully that's a good introduction for the summary statement here. The next section that we will typically see is a skill section or competencies or areas of expertise. There's a bunch of different ways that people will name this. Um, this section is really, in my mind, functions as kind of an introduction to here, here are the skills, the top skills, not all of my skills. Here are the top skills that are really relevant to you in this job that I have. And, and this is important, that I'm going to show you in later sections of the resume. Almost always, you want to, if you're stating something like critical thinking, in your experience, in your skills section, you want to back that up with an action verb statement somewhere in your experiences that shows that you have critical thinking skills. Here's the reason why. If you tell me that you have critical thinking skills or storytelling or project management, I'm like, great, that sounds wonderful. I need someone like that. I have no idea where you got that from. You could just be putting words on a piece of paper, right? 
context matters on a resume. So when you give me a list of your competencies here at the front end of the resume, support that later on in the resume so that if I'm not sitting there questioning, well, it says relationship building. I don't see anywhere on here where they've built relationships in the past. Don't leave me questioning your skills, right? So provide context, provide support for these particular skills, um, particularly if you're listing soft skills here. If you list soft skills here, interpersonal communication, you'll see some of them listed in some of these things, right? If you're listing soft skills here, make sure they have context because anyone can tell me that they have communication skills. Where you got those and how you've utilized them and what the successes have been as a result of those is what I really care about, right? Uh, so support for these is important, but this section gives me a very quick glance at the beginning of what I'm going to bring to the table to this company. Sometimes this section also includes things that are hard to capture in your action verb statements. Maybe it's something that you got at a lot of your experiences. And so it's not like I can pinpoint it to like one thing, right? Um, this section becomes useful for that as well, okay? All right, the next section, almost always is gonna be education. Now I'll caveat this with, as you grow through your field, after you've been in the field for a little while, your education section will move down in your resume or your CV. Um, when you first get your degree, it's kind of the new thing. It's the big thing that you recently did. And so you want to focus on that. And it's typically the first thing you will list. After you've had experiences in the field and had jobs where you had to have the degree in order to get the job, the education starts to take a back seat to those experiences. And so education will typically come first now, but later on it will work its way down the resume as it kind of loses its importance because your experiences actually become the focal point, right? Okay. Order and things in this, uh, again, a little bit of the for formatting and functionality depends on you. Um, it's going to be reverse chronological. I always will say, list your degree first, put the formatting on your degree. This says bold, it doesn't have to be bold. I like bold, that's my personal preference. Um, that draws my eye, right? A bold tells me where to look next. Bullets also tell me where to look next. And you'll see that as we get into the examples. Uh, certifications and licenses also come into play here. This can be listed after your degrees as like a subsection under education, or it can even just be its own section. You can just have a section for certifications and licenses. If your field is like, that's the field is all about licenses and certifications, um, I would do its own section. It just make its own section, list your certifications um, and have those included for sure. Um, here's what it might look like. So you've got your education header. Notice this particular sample uses all caps. Doesn't have to be. This is just what this sample uses. They've got that nice line in kind of a gray tone, right? You could make that line, could maybe have that earthy color to it maybe, right? Um, and then they've got their formatting. So their formatting in this particular example is bolded degree, right? Italicized place and city state, and then regular text down there for the bulleted action verb kind of statement-y type thing. Your education doesn't have to have action verb statements tied to it. Sometimes it might if you're talking about maybe a scholarship or, or something like that. GPA also could be included in here if it's important to the field you're going into. Um, oftentimes, once you've got a master's degree, sometimes, especially if you have a PhD, GPA starts to just take a back seat. You, you've done the work, you've got the degree. GPA matters a little bit less in those instances. But if you've got a GPA that you want to brag about, throw GPA on here. You'll notice in the dates, this is where we start to answer that question as to, do I indicate that I am a student or not? Yes, probably right here uh, in, in this section. Um, you're gonna put your expected grad date. If your expected grad date is in the future, that will indicate to them, hopefully if they're reading and paying attention, um, that you are still indeed a student. Notice we don't put inclusive dates here. We just put the grad date. Um, again, this one lists a bachelor's degree. If you have a master's degree as well, or are working towards a master's degree or PhD, you would list that first because it's the most recent experience then include your bachelor's degree and any other degrees you have. If you have two associate's degrees, a bachelor's degree, and you're working on your master's, I would probably have all of them listed in this section. Uh, we might debate from a space standpoint, are we keeping all of them? Probably that we are. Um, we want to show your entire academic experience um, throughout your, your kind of academic history. Certifications, again, you'll see the format carries through, right? Bolded is the certification. 
then what where the certification is from is kind of in that italicized kind of uh, font and then you go to uh, the dates notice the dates are aligned off to the right hand side this is a personal preference choice where you put the dates is up to you some people will just do a dash or a comma or one of the i don't even know what they're called actually the the vert the vertical lines um those work really well in resumes as well um to separate things I like them aligned off to the side because it fills the white space. White space accumulates over there. And if you put the dates over there, that helps with this particular uh, white space problem that people typically have. Um, I also think that dates are kind of like tertiary information. I, I just, they're not, it's not important. So if you need it, I'm going to put it over there. What's the last thing you read? If you want to find it, you can go find it if you want to. Um, but it's just, it's all, it's over there. Like focus on other things is basically what I'm telling you. Don't look at the dates are not important. Focus on the things I want to tell you. All right. I am rapidly running out of time. So I'm going to click through some slides and see if I can't uh, speak faster. I don't know if that's possible. I'll try to speak more succinctly. How about that? Experience section. This is a big, important section on your resume. Uh, we're going to have a, a job title, a functional job title. So if your job title kind of makes no sense outside of the company, you might want to tweak it a little bit so that it's more sensical potentially um, for the job that you're that you're looking for. Uh, again, we're not exaggerating or lying about the job title. So make it fit still, right, what you were doing. But again, functional job title, company name, city, state. Now we're going to inclusive dates, right? Month, year to month, year. Sometimes we see a brief description of the company or the place here. This is typical if maybe the name of the company is like, maybe they wouldn't know what that company did. I'm not a huge fan necessarily of this particular section. It is optional. I have seen it work for people. Keep it short, two lines probably tops on a description um, and make sure that it's providing the reader with information that's important about you. That's why I usually will leave it out because typically it's just information about the company you used to work for. If that provides context for the skills that you're bringing to the table, then it could be potentially beneficial. Uh, but most of the time, I want to get right to those action verb statements, highlighting my relevant skills, abilities, and accomplishments um, in that section. Again, reverse chronological order. Our statements are going to start with action verbs. I'm going to say past tense only because I think that that's the way to go. And here's what it might look like. Okay, You'll notice the formatting is very consistent from the education section to this. I can find the title and the degree in the same place. I can find the dates in the same place. I can find the city states in the same place, right? But now we're focusing on action verb statements. Promoted from staff writer to features editor within the first six months of employment. You choose a keyword, okay? And this is where soft skills come into play, right? Those transferable skills, communication, time management, leadership, all of those things can be skills that you want to list. Pick your keyword, your skill ability word, your action verb. And then I like to say, answer two questions about it, right? So if I want to say that I was promoted and that was something I wanted to tout, I was promoted from what to what, when, right? So the what and the when, I answer two questions about that. If I want to say um, that I can coordinate, I can coordinate what and with who, right? So answer two questions about that skill word that you're choosing. And that typically will give you a pretty good action verb statement. You don't want to push much past that because your statements will get too bulky. They'll be too much. Uh, two lines tops, two lines tops for almost any action verb statement. I've seen three if it's necessary, absolutely necessary. One to two lines is perfectly plenty for these. I like to suggest anywhere from three to six action verb statements per experience with six being more the more recent, more relevant experiences and trending down towards three for your older, maybe less relevant experiences. If you're just pulling from transferable skills or soft skills out of those experiences, three is probably a better number because the amount of action verb statements that comes after an experience kind of indicates to me importance level, right? As a reader, like, oh, this, one, this one's got a lot of action verb statements. That's the more important one to read, right? That's what it tells me. Hopefully that makes sense in the fastest possible time that I can give it to you. And, and again, I'll, I'll hopefully leave a couple minutes here for questions at the end. Community involvement is a really nice section. Again, you'll notice um, that this is formatted exactly the same. All the information is in the same places, right, um, as you're looking at here. Usually this comes after the experience section or even at the very end. Um, 
be careful about listing like really old experiences or one-off things that you did like five years ago. Like if you're, if you're taking the time to utilize this valuable real estate on your resume to put this experience, uh, make sure that it's recent and valuable. Sometimes we'll see some action verb statements if you gain some skills from this, particularly those soft skills or transferable skills. Usually we're going to go more along the lines of like one to two bullets here rather than the three to six bullets, but it depends on the experience and the skills that you gained from it, how you want to kind of portray that. I like this section because it shows well-roundedness, right? I'm not just a student or a worker. Uh, I also am involved in the community. Some companies feed off of that a lot, okay? Look at your look at the company you're applying to. Do your research. Do they have a company culture of community service, of volunteerism? If they do, this section becomes much more important on your resume than with companies who maybe don't quite have that culture. Uh, in my previous employer, we worked with a, an engineering company who was very, very big on community service and involvement. They function out of a small town. And if you didn't have this section, that was like an instant red flag on your resume um, at that engineering company for engineers, right? Um, so be aware of the company culture that can help inform what is important on your resume. Technology or computer skills, and this is similar to if you're including languages and other things, um, it's going to probably go last unless technology or computer skills is a big part of your job. If you're a computer science major, um, you probably want to bring this section up to the top. It might even be uh, above your experiences, um, depending on what you're kind of looking for in a job description, right? So be aware of that. Um, any and all technology is fair game here if it's relevant to the job. Um, it could be things like Microsoft Office, Microsoft Word, but it could be very specific computer softwares and hardwares that you've worked with um, or even uh, other technology that you're familiar with. Sometimes I'll use descriptor words here like proficient in these ones, knowledgeable in these ones, and familiar with these ones. Uh, if you put familiar with, be sure you're willing to use it within a job environment. If you're going to list it, probably you need to be proficient enough that you'd be willing to use it in a job environment. Same with languages. Languages, fluent in, conversational in, familiar with. But again, if you put familiar with Spanish on your resume, you better be willing to use it in a professional setting. Otherwise, let's just not talk about it. Here's what it looks like all put together. Um, so you kind of see again, easy readability. I'm showing the reader where I want them to go from the headers to the bold parts, to the bullets, and my eyes are drawn to those words. And very quickly on this resume, I can see that this person promotes, coordinates, oversaw, proofread, researched, developed, provided, took, created, designed, proofread, coordinated, right? So I get a list of your skills right off the bat from those action verb statements next to the bullets. Uh, we want that readability. We want that functionality. All right. I've successfully left like two two minutes for questions. So <laughs> let's take some questions to round things out. All right. So we have a question about a gap year. Looks like due to the pandemic because of hardship. Where would you put that on a resume? Yes. Um, if it's a gap in your education, it doesn't matter um, because we're only going to list graduation dates. So there's not inclusive dates educationally. Right. Um, so we don't have to worry about that from the education side because we're just putting expected grad date or grad date on your on your degrees. From an experiences standpoint, um, I, I worry less and less about this nowadays. Um, so many people have gaps from the recession, from the pandemic, from different things. So I, I worry about it less and less now, but if it's something you're concerned about, that's usually something that I would wanna probably have a conversation about with. That how do we maybe format your resume to have maybe a relevant experience section that highlights something a little differently, like more recent or even older, that's in a relevant experience section so that we're not emphasizing the fact that maybe the gap was recent or, the, or uh, there's a gap like between different experiences. So there are ways from a formatting perspective that we can address that. Uh, I, I, my, I guess, encouragement is I'm less and less concerned about that sort of thing. The more oftentimes I'm seeing that on resumes, uh, employers would be kind of foolish at this point to be excluding based off of that because they'd be excluding a lot of people. Good point. <laughs> Um, we have a question about, so I know we already talked about not putting your photo on the resume. What about a logo? Yes, uh, this is something uh, that I've seen. I personally, I'm not really a fan of this, particularly in the more formal fields. Uh, if you're in a more creative field or a more design oriented field, this is one of those places where you can play around a little bit more. Um, that's something to think about. Um, 
if it's a logo for like a personal business you run, that's probably like, that's going to be frowned upon, right? So we're not going to want to do something like that. If it's like, like you consult on the side or something, like, we're going to probably leave those types of things off. Um, again, if it's a design oriented field, maybe we could get away with something like that. But for the most part, um, we don't typically see those on resumes. Uh, what is your uh, opinion or thoughts on putting continuing education units under the education section? Yep. Yep, absolutely. If especially um, if they're tied to certifications, if it's tied to licensure in any way, shape, or form, um, that's definitely a section that we can see. Um, and and again, more maybe under the certifications and licensure to show that you're staying current on those things. Um, those are definitely things that we can include. Um, if it if it lends to your knowledge in the field, we don't necessarily want to exclude it. That's for sure uh, on the resume. Okay. Uh, and then what about, um, I see something in the chat, I'm assuming it is possibly a, a North Central grad. They got a degree from the university. It's now merged with national. Um, what do you think about the name of the university on the resume? Yeah, this is a really good question. Uh, and, and Jane can probably uh, also contribute um, to this as well. Uh, we, we've seen this quite a few times. Um, yeah. Honestly, I think it's your choice at this point. If you uh, if you're an alum and you have your degree and your formal paperwork says that it is a North Central University degree, probably you will want to put North Central because it matches your transcripts, it matches your degree. You might then put in parentheses um, now National University, or, or you put National University formerly North Central University in parentheses afterwards. Those are popular options for dealing with this. The reason for that being, if we list just North Central University and then no one can find North Central University anymore online, they're like, is this a real degree? It is, um, and we want them to know that. So some indicator, National University, formerly North Central, If even if you're a current student um, that, that was an NCU student and you want to talk about the fact that you were at NCU because that's a pride point for you, which is totally legitimate, um, definitely list it that way, right? National University is what you'll find on my degree or what you'll find now, formerly North Central University in parentheses afterwards. Okay, perfect. I don't think I have any other questions. Awesome. Um, I will leave everyone with this then. Um, here is uh, how to access our services within Career Services. Uh, we use a system called Handshake. If you have a dot n or an nu.edu email, you can use your single sign on to sign in. If you are a student with an ncu.edu email, email us, contact us. We will get you the information. Email is the best way because we could talk you through it, but it's it's easier to send you a sheet with links that you can actually go through. Um, so if you're an NCU student with an NCU email address, send us an email. We'll send you the instructions for how to access Handshake. Uh, it's just a slightly different process. You get full access just like everybody else, just not through the single sign-in uh, because the Handshake is very particular about that suffix. But if you're an NU student with the, the nu.edu email address, just use your single sign-on. You can access all of our services through Handshake, um, through the, the chiclet in your single sign-on portal, or just go to join.handshake.com. Uh, or no, sorry, joinhandshake.com, no dot. Joinhandshake.com will also bring you to the Handshake website and you can sign in there using your NU single sign-in information. Um, and that will get you access to everything we do, including our one-on-one -on -one appointments, our workshop series, um, all of our job board and internship portal stuff. Uh, we have events that go on with employers throughout the year as well. Uh, so there's a bunch of cool services for you um, through that handshake system. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dr. Vartstra. I appreciate it. Um, I think I learned quite a bit and so did our attendees. Awesome. Well, thank you all for having me. Uh, very, very good questions throughout. I appreciate the participation. And as a reminder, um, typically within about 24 hours, I will get um, the recording uh, up onto our Graduate Studies Support Center skill up page. Thank you, everyone.